Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're almost ready to get started, so if you could get seated, it would be terrific. See, we have a lot of people coming in. Um, good morning and welcome to this session on income inequality. My name is Steve Adler. I'm editor-in-chief of Reuters, and I am delighted to welcome Steve Ratner, who will speak on the topic. Um, Steve uh, is a very busy guy. He manages both the uh, personal and philanthropic investments of Mike Bloomberg, which you would think would keep him pretty busy just by itself. But uh, Steve does many other things. Steve is a uh, economic uh, analyst on Morning Joe, and he is a frequent op-ed writer for the New York Times. And uh, Steve has, has thought a great deal about in income inequality, makes a very interesting presentation. Now, Steve had the kind of, I guess, good economic, uh, made a good economic decision to leave investment banking and private, uh, to leave, I'm sorry, journalism to go into investment banking and private equity early in his career. Um, I didn't make that choice, so that may reflect the income inequality between Steve and myself. Um, however, I think we'll take a look at the issue in a much bigger way. So uh, let me turn it over to Steve, who has a bit of a presentation. Uh, then afterwards, he and I will discuss the topic a bit, and then we'll open it up to probably the most productive part uh, where we'll have a discussion with the audience. Steve. Uh, th thanks so much, Steve. Appreciate that introduction. And uh, we may have inequality between us, but as I'm going to show in this presentation, you're still firmly in the 1%, so welcome. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to just, uh, uh, before I start, uh, in addition to thanking Steve for that introduction, thank uh, Kitty Boone and the Aspen Ideas Festival not just for having me here to do this, but also originally my panel was supposed to be in the afternoon and for reasons I don't know, it was moved to the morning, which is very fortuitous because I will not be competing against the US-Germany soccer match. So thank you all, <laughs> thank you all um, very much for coming. Um, on, a, on a more serious note, I was struck yesterday, and maybe some of you were too, by the fact that the first question uh, that Secretary Clinton was asked from Facebook after Walter finished his really wonderful uh, tour of the world with her was about income inequality. And she gave uh, an extraordinarily eloquent and passionate uh, answer. I don't think I can match her for her eloquence, but I do feel quite passionate about this, that this is a defining moral issue of our time. It's one that threatens the fabric of our society. And it's one that, we, uh, that as she said, we clearly need to do something about. What I'm going to do is take you through a presentation of some of the facts, I think, uh, in the discussion about income inequality, facts sometimes fall by the side. But I want to at least show you the historic evidence, which I think is incontrovertible. I want to talk about, about some of the ramifications of that, where there is some debate. And then I want to talk about what we really do need to do to address this issue now. Um, now, Steve, uh, Steve was nice to say that I had been thinking about this issue for some time. But I suspect many of you, maybe most of you out there, are wondering what I am doing up here, given the background that he just read. And, you know, I'm not a former Secretary of State. I'm not a former Senator, I'm not a f former First Lady. I'm not a, uh, what else am I not? I'm not a renowned economist. I'm not an economist at all. But it is an issue that I have been thinking about for a long time. And, oops, there we go. Uh, that I've been thinking about for, uh, for a long time. Uh, back in 1995, I wrote this piece for the uh, Wall Street Journal, and uh, one historic footnote about it was I was very, quite shocked that they published it because you see the headline, it's the Wall Street Journal, and I called up the young editor who was doing it, and I said, well, why uh, did you publish it? And he said, well, I thought it was an important issue that needed to be discussed. That young editor was called David Brooks, and he has gone on to a few other things, uh, a few other things since then. Um, by the end of this presentation, you may find that uh, this article a little quaint in the sense, well, how did that happen? A little quaint in the sense that uh, what was perceived to be a problem in 1995 uh, was barely a problem relative to where we are today. Now, income inequality has come back into uh, the news lately in part because of this book by an, a French economist called uh, Thomas Piketty. Many have commented that the title Capital is a play on Karl Marx as maybe the red border. But nonetheless, it has become an instant, I'm having trouble with my clicker, whoops, instant bestseller. It's become an instant bestseller. It spent 112 days on the Amazon top 100 list. It spent eight weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, including uh, reaching the number one spot for a week. And this is despite the fact that the book was written in French, it was translated into English, 
It's 577 pages of text and another 75 pages of footnotes. And if you read it, and we won't have a quiz on how many people here read it, you would have learned some interesting things. You would have learned the equilibrium wealth to annual income ratio. You would have learned the inherited share of wealth. And you would have learned the equilibrium share of income from wealth to total income. So I'm not sure whether everybody who bought the book has read it, but the fact that it has attracted so much attention I think is symbolic and important uh, indication of how important this issue is today. Now let me take you through, let me try to click, oh, that's too far. Let me take you through uh, what I think is some remarkable data and hopefully you'll be able to see this problem uh, in living color. Okay. Um, some of you may have seen this chart before, but what it really shows is, is how extraordinarily well the highest uh, income Americans have done in the past 100 years. It's compiled from tax data. Uh, the income tax started just about 100 years ago, so that's where the data starts. The green line at the top is the famous 1% of Americans, those who had an income, uh, if you want to know what it takes to be in the 1%, it was $370,000 in 2012. There's 1.6 million households in this group, so they're not all hedge fund guys. Um, and back in two, 1913, when the uh, income tax was first instituted, this 1% got about 18% of all the income in the country. And as of 2012, it had risen to 19.3, so a record level, a record share of all the income going to the top 1%. And then you can see in between, we did have a period of much lower income inequality, which I'll, I will be talking about uh, a, bit more, uh, a bit more later. Now the bottom line, the bottom red line, shows an even more privileged group. This is the top 0.01%. This is 16,000 households, 16,000 households out of 350 million Americans who had an income of $7.2 million in 2012. And over the, over the same time period, you can actually see a more extreme problem that the share that this group got, these 16,000 households, went from 2.8% to 4.1%. Now, if you turn to wealth, you'll see that the problem, in a way, is even greater. So the, there we go. Turn to wealth, you'll see the problem is even greater. So the blue line at the bottom is the 1% that I was looking at, uh, that we were talking about before. And you can see that in 2010, that 1% had 17.4% of, uh, of all the wealth in this country. Now, if you're curious to know uh, what it takes to be in the top 1% on wealth, it's $4 million. In 2010, it was $4 million. The, uh, the red line, uh, uh, sorry, the blue line is the income share, I apologize. The income share that we looked at before. The red line is the share of wealth and you can see that the share of wealth that this group has is almost exactly double the share of income that this group has, and it is that, it is that, 20, uh, that $20 million. There we go. Okay, this chart is uh, a little complicated, but it's gonna show you how even those at the top of the 1% have done much better than the rest of the 1% when it comes to wealth. So if you start with the bar at the bottom and you turn that bar vertically, that bar decomposes the 1%. So the gray part from 1% to 0.5 is the bottom half of the 1%, if you're with me. The black uh, line, bar, and then becomes a line in the chart, is between 0.5 and 0.1%. The blue gets up toward the top. It's 0.1 to 0.01%. And the red is that 0.01%, that same 16,000 households that we have been talking about. And this is, again, done in terms of wealth. And what you can see is that the people in the light gray area, the bottom half of the 1%, their share of wealth actually hasn't gone up much at all. In fact, it's gone even down slightly. If you look at the next group up the black line, it went down, it's come back up again, but pretty flat. It's only when you get to the blue, and certainly when you get to the red, that you can see where the increasing share of wealth has gone to. It is this 0.01%. Uh, and again, if you're curious to know, it is $100 million of net worth to be in that group. Now, the US, the US has not only uh, become much more unequal, but it isn't, by at least some measures, the most unequal country among major nations. On the left, you can see a number that maybe is familiar by now. We've been talking about it. It's the 17.4% uh, 
of income that the top 1% have. And I've compared this to a selection of developed and emerging countries, the UK, Germany, France, Sweden, and then two developing countries, China and India. And so you can see that, that as of the moment, in the US, the top 1% has a higher share of income than the 1% in any of those countries. Now, to be fair, there are other measures of studying income inequality, including something called the Gini ratio for any, any geeks that are out there, um, and gets you slightly different results. Some show China and India a little bit more unequal than the US. But the bottom line is that we, are, we have become highly unequal and highly uh, uh, unequal relative to the other major countries around the world. Back again. All right, sorry about the technology. Um, now, one of the more interesting aspects of income inequality is the way it's evolved in the developing world with English-speaking countries having produced far more inequality than, uh, than other developed countries, non-English-speaking countries. So I've chosen four countries uh, to look at here, the US and the UK, which are the red line and the blue line and France and Sweden, the green and the uh, orange. And so if you look back again to 1910, you can see that as uh, the share of wealth came down during the uh, Depression and during the two world wars, the four countries more or less moved in a similar fashion. But you can see that in about 1970, it started to diverge. And the US and the UK's uh, amount of income inequality grew quite rapidly. And in France and in Sweden, it grew slightly. Why did that happen? It's a function probably of public policy, different taxation policies, different social welfare policies, and also some less tangible uh, societal norms, such as how much it is deemed socially acceptable for a CEO to make and things like that. But the, the divergence is quite remarkable. Now let's turn to wealth in these same countries. There we go. Uh, and let's do a little, a little audience participation here. So how many of you are Jane Austen fans? A few Jane Austen fans, okay. So if you look at this chart, which goes back to 1810, and it shows wealth in these shares of wealth in these countries, the blue line is the UK. And you can see that in the first part of the 19th century, in the Jane Austen uh, heyday, so to speak, the top 1% in the UK had between 55 and 60% of all the wealth. And they were, uh, oddly enough, Sweden was up there with them, but way ahead of France. And you can see the US with only 25 to 30% wealth among the top 1% at the time. Now, how many people here are Downton Abbey fans? More, OK. Well, it won't surprise you then to, know, to see that when Downton Abbey begins, which you remember was with the sinking of the Titanic in 1912, the blue line, which was uh, wealth inequality in the UK, literally hit a peak at about 70%. And so the whole Downton Abbey phenomenon is very much a reality in statistics. And then if you follow the series through and the effects of the war and changing fortunes, you can, see, you can see what happened in all these countries, but very much so in the UK, where the share of wealth that went to the top 1% declined very precipitously. And by the time you get to 2010, the whole situation has reversed itself, and the US is now has the highest share of wealth inequality of these four countries compared to the UK, Sweden, and France. And so we've had this remarkable reversal where in the 19th century, the US was the most egal egalitarian of these countries, the most uh, able for people uh, to accumulate wealth. And by the time you get to 2010, maybe not on the scale of Downton Abbey, but we have come the closest to the Downton Abbey uh, world. Now, all of this would not be so terrible if I could get the slide to change. Um, there we go. Um, all of this would not be uh, so bad if the middle class had, uh, had done well at the same time. A rising tide where everybody is, li is lifted, I think some amount of income inequality certain can, certainly can be tolerated. And you can even make an argument that it's, uh, it's good for an economy. But this is not what has happened. What has happened, in fact, is that the US, the US middle class has actually uh, lost its lead. There was a time when being in the middle class in the US relative to our, uh, our other developed countries in Europe meant that uh, you were more prosperous, you had more income, you had more things, and that's no longer quite so true. 
If you look at this chart all the way over on the right, you see a little red sliver, and that is the change in median incomes to U.S. workers in the first decade of the 21st century when you adjust for inflation. So what it says in English is that no, nothing happened to these people. They, they'd had no improvement in their standard of living once you take inflation into account. But meanwhile, in all these other countries, you can see that their middle class, their average worker, was seeing its income go up quite substantially during this period. Uh, and particularly in Canada and Britain, there are reasons why Germany didn't uh, go up as much that have to do with the integration of East Germany and things that are not, I'm not going to talk about today. But the point is they all went up except for us. And so the consequence of that is that we are no longer the world's richest, if you define richest as having the highest incomes for your middle class. We are tied in this chart with Canada, but this data is a year or two old, and I think almost all of us would believe that today Canada's middle uh, income uh, households make more than we do. And then you can see um, the others are still below us, but they, are, they have caught up a lot as the previous chart shows. And also bear in mind that Americans uh, actually work more hours. They have fewer paid vacation days, less benefits, and a smaller uh, social safety net. So these incomes in that context are even less uh, valuable than they are in other countries with different levels of government services. Now, while you can argue about some of the data that I've presented, and people have been arguing about it, I don't think you can argue about the trends. I think they are incontrovertible. The causes, the uh, consequences and what we should do about it are more complex. I'm not going to have time to go into all that in, in complete detail, but let me give you a sense of what I think is going on. So I've, I've boiled this down to basically two primary causes and some other, and some other things. Uh, one, of course, is technological change and what that does to workers uh, who are not skilled in those areas. Uh, another is globalization. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these as I go through a couple other slides. Another is globalization, the fact that other countries around the world are better and better at competing with us and can offer lower and lower priced labor. And then you have what I call secondary causes, the change in tax policies that have gone on in the U.S. versus what's happened elsewhere, which I'll talk about. Things like declining unionization. And there are even phenomena going on that, uh, like which we call winner-take-all markets, where if you study even uh, professions you would have never imagined, dentists, plumbers, pretty much every profession, the very best, uh, the very best performers in those industries have, are, have earn, are now earning considerably more than the rest of the group by a wider margin than they have in the past. So let's turn to technology. And the way I want to illustrate this for you is to show you uh, that if you had any doubt about what kinds of skills are in demand in the world today, I think this will hope, hopefully convince you. So this goes back to 1979, and it breaks Americans down by education. The first blue bar on the left are Americans who did not finish high school. Their incomes after you adjust for inflation have gone down 25% over that time period. Those who had high school but no college, their incomes have gone down 13%. Some college 11%, and you can see a bachelor's degree or higher up 16%. Now, it is also worth noting that this goes back to 1979, as I said, that since 2000, even a bachelor's degree has not been enough. Earnings of people with just a bachelor's degree have actually gone down 1%. During that time period for your, for your income, again, all these numbers are after inflation. During that time period for your income after inflation to go up, you needed to have a uh, an advanced degree, and even then, you would have seen your pay go up by uh, two-tenths of a percent. So you can see what's happening with uh, the effect of skills on the labor force. Let me talk now about globalization for a second. Um, and the way I'm going to do this is to look at different wage sectors, those that uh, are more part of the global economy, what we call tradable sectors, and those that are more domestic service types of businesses. So you start at the top, and this chart goes from June of 2009, which was the bottom of the recession, to May of 2014, which is very recently. And it basically says that total private wages, that's that little red piece at the top, have gone down by 0.5%. In other words, after inflation, the average worker, uh, you saw that number, a similar number before for a somewhat different time period, but you see that the average worker is actually a little bit less, uh, a little bit less well off. But if you break that into different industries, you can see that in some industries, financial services, mining and logging, uh, information, wages actually went up. You can see that in other industries, education, health, retail, trade, pretty flat. 
And then as you get further down into manufacturing in the auto industry, you can see uh, in the auto industry, which I'm very familiar with from my time in public service, down 11%. And I'll tell you just a quick story, but uh, uh, before about five years ago, the typical Detroit uh, auto worker who was part of a union and uh, part of the system had $28 an hour of cash wages and about the same in other benefits. Uh, when Volkswagen came to Chattanooga in 2009 and hired 2,000 new workers, it pay, he pay, they paid them $14.5 an hour to start, and they had people lined up around the block for those jobs. So that's half the starting wage. It's about $30,000 a year. It is not what we would have called a good middle class job a few years ago. But that's all because of competitive pressure from countries around the world that can offer it cheaper. General Motors total, in 2009, General Motors total cost of an employee was about $65 an hour. In Mexico, they paid $7.5 an hour. In uh, China, they paid $4.5 an hour. In India, they paid $1 an hour. And I can tell you that in places like Mexico, their productivity is very, very high. So I mentioned the uh, effect of taxes on, uh, on inequality. And so let's take a look at this chart, which compares taxes and inequality. So across the bottom, we have changes in tax rates since 1960. So all the way on the right, you see the zero at the vertical. That's countries that didn't change their tax rates, their top marginal tax rates at all. As you move to the left, you see countries that lowered their top tax rate. And then similarly, as you go up the vertical axis, you, axis, you see more and more income inequality. So in the lower right, you see Spain, Germany, Switzerland, no real change in their tax rates, no real change in their inequality. You see in the upper left, the US and the UK, very substantial reductions in marginal tax rates increases in inequality, and you could draw a line through these points, and it wouldn't be a perfect correlation, but it would be a pretty strong, uh, a pretty strong correlation. Now, just to give you a little, uh, a little anecdote, of, or not a fact, of what happened in the US, the IRS every year releases the income tax rates of the top uh, 400 taxpayers. In 1992, it was about 30% of their income. In 2007, it had dropped to 17% of their income. In fairness, for a variety of reasons, it's probably up around 20% at the moment, but still a lot less than it, uh, than it was uh, as recently as the early 1990s. Now, I said that I was going to try to uh, balance all this out and give you as many facts as I could. And so one of, the, uh, one of the things that you should know when you look at all the data I just showed you is that it is really before government gets involved. It is people's pre-tax income uh, as they report it. But since 1912, when the income tax went into effect, government has come to provide many, many uh, services, uh, including, including uh, you know, things like food stamps, earned income tax uh, uh, credits, trial nutrition, trial nutrition, excuse me, housing assistance, and so on. And so what you see in this chart is that if you're in the top 1%, you basically are getting little or no uh, transfers from the government for these kinds of things. And then if you go all the way over to the left, and you see the bottom 20%. 74% uh, of the income or of the money coming in, the services coming into these people are coming through government transfers. And it, all it means to say is that the income, well, the income inequality problem is probably not as great as what you see when you look at things like Piketty's data uh, relative to where it was, but it is still huge. And I don't want to uh, let anybody uh, have a different impression. Now, it's also important to note, to note that the US actually does less to, uh, to reduce income inequality than many of our, or if not all, of the developed countries that we uh, view as peers. So what this chart does, it uses a different measure of income inequality than what we've been talking about. But it basically the, it takes the light blue bars and it shows you what the amount of income inequality is in the society before the government gets involved. And you can see that the US is actually not that different from the UK and Germany, somewhat more unequal than Sweden. And then it adds the dark blue bars, which is what happens when the government gets involved, and how much redistribution, in effect, the government uh, accomplishes. And you can see once the government gets done, the US has the highest level of income inequality, followed by the UK, Germany, uh, and Sweden. Now, let me turn to some areas where there is disagreement uh, among economists and other people who study this issue about what some of the consequences are. Uh, one, one, uh, one theme that you see a lot is that income inequality is associated with uh, immobility, with, with not being able to rise to the uh, next economic level. And what this chart does, and it was done by Alan Kruger, a very distinguished economist who's also chairman of 
uh, President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, is it basically takes the amount of income inequality. So as you move from left to right, the bottom, you get more and more income inequality. So you have Finland, Norway, Denmark on the left, the US on the right. And then as you go up, you have more immobility, more lack of mobility. So at the top, you have the UK and the US with less mobility. And at the bottom, Finland, Norway, and Denmark with more uh, uh, immobility. And so I think it is probably, I think it is a fact that we do have less income mobility than countries in Europe. But what I think is different from perhaps the popular uh, wisdom is it is not at all clear that income mobility has gotten worse in this country as income inequality has gotten worse. So this is another study done by two distinguished Harvard uh, professors. And it takes the population, it divides it into five 20% sections. And what it shows, going back to 1971, uh, and you can see these lines are essentially flat. What it shows going back to 1971 is that, is that income mobility, economic mobility, hasn't really changed, even though income inequality has gotten a lot worse. Another area where uh, economists disagree is the question of whether higher income inequality leads to uh, lower growth. And so the IMF has weighed in on this recently. This is an IMF chart. And what this does, similar to some of the other charts I've shown you, Greater income inequality is on the, across the bottom line axis. And sus what they call sustained growth rate, they measure growth their own way. But basically, the growth rate is across the vertical axis. All those orange dots are countries. And when you draw a line through it, you see a correlation in which uh, it appears that the more income inequality, the less sustained economic growth you're likely to have. Now, you could look at this another way. And you could take a chart that also uh, puts the growth rate of GDP across the bottom. And it puts inequality across the vertical. And all those little triangles are countries. I don't know if you can read them back there, but they're all there. And you don't see any real recognizable pattern. You see countries uh, like Denmark with relatively um, small amounts of income inequality and also relatively small uh, growth rates. And you see, and you see countries uh, like the, well, the US, obviously, with uh, high income inequality, but the US is also arguably the fastest growing company, country in the developed world, even though we have the highest level of income inequality. So it is not obvious to me that uh, among the many, many reasons why we should address this, that, uh, that, uh, that addressing it would necessarily change our growth rate. There are even those who believe that trying to reduce income inequality would have a negative effect on growth. Uh, I don't have a chart on that, but there, there is another school of thought in that direction. So in turning to solutions, um, let me emphasize that there is no silver bullet. There is no one magic way of doing this. I think, uh, I think um, Secretary Clinton made that clear as well yesterday. Let me just run through a few things that I think are on the table or should be as, uh, as things we should do. Um, any, uh, uh, everything I've said to you before about the effect of technology and globalization clearly should lead everybody to believe that more of a focus on education uh, is, a, is an important part of it. But I think as we talk about education, I think we should also be clear that this doesn't mean that, every, uh, that everybody should go to a four-year liberal arts college and major in philosophy. I have nothing against philosophy. I have nothing against four-year liberal arts colleges. But, we, ha but we, we do have to focus on providing people with the skills they need for the jobs. If I go back to my Volkswagen anecdote, when Volkswagen hired those 2,000 workers, they had thousands and thousands of applicants. But even the best of them were not actually qualified. And they had to go out and bring trainers in from Germany to train them to operate uh, the machinery that was there now. Secondly, uh, the, the tax system. I think I've shown you, uh, I think it is pretty incontrovertible, the effect of uh, what we've done to our tax system on income inequality uh, back since uh, uh, President Reagan started cutting taxes. And I think when we think about the tax system, I think we need to uh, be willing to at least mentally embrace a word that is sort of a dirty word, and that's redistribution. I think that in a situation we're in now, where there are so many global effects on people's ability to find jobs, have jobs, and what they get paid for doing those jobs, I think those of us who are a lot more fortunate, because we have the skills that are in demand today, need to be more generous in creating, uh, in creating a, um, a social safety mechanism that allows everybody to have a reasonable standard of living. And I say that not just as a moral issue, but also as a practical issue, because I don't believe a society can really function 
uh, with extreme levels of income inequality for very long. Um, things like, by the way, the Affordable Care Act is a form of redistribution. It is a form of creating a social safety net for people uh, in this situation. And then a couple more uh, quick things. I think, uh, I think the government, there's a lot the government can do to generally increase the growth rate by things like investing in research and development, things like infrastructure. We've cut in half over the last 20 years as a, me by, uh, as a percentage of GDP, our investment in these areas. And this would raise the overall growth rate, which would help everybody. And finally, and again, a subject that's outside of the purview of this uh, is trade and the fact that I think um, uh, I, at least, and I hope all of you are free traders at heart, but have to recognize the effects of trade are not equal and they're winners and losers and we need to make sure that our trade is fair. So let me just close in a way where I began with in, in terms of this chart because, you know, I was born in 1952 and if you look at that chart, you'll see that back then the top 1% had less than 10% of the income. And as I grew up, that percentage fell further to 7.7%. And not and not only did we have a fairer sharing of the pie during that time, but we also had robust, uh, robust economic growth. So I believe that we can, uh, I believe that we can solve this problem. I believe that we can make this a more equal society and have robust economic growth, but it will take some very uh, forward-leaning policies from government, and that's really where it has to happen. Uh, and if we do that, we, will, we could get to a better place. The trajectory we're on now, uh, is not a good trajectory, and I don't really see any sign of it ebbing uh, left to its own devices. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, that was really fascinating and I think raises a lot of questions. Actually, I want to ask a question of the audience first uh, to tee up my first question to you. Uh, how many of you think inequality, uh, income inequality is a serious problem that requires public policy uh, work. Okay. Now, that leads to my question, which is, do you think there's actually a popular consensus in this country that both believes income inequality is a problem and that there should be public policy solutions? And I ask that in part because you see the trend towards libertarianism, the push towards smaller government, and um, I mean, is there truly a, um, a political consensus that this needs to be addressed at all? Uh I think there is, no, I, I don't think there is, unfortunately. I think, I, I'm not sure in a, in a randomly selected group of Americans you would have gotten quite right. as many hands up as you would at the Aspen Ideas Festival, but, uh, but, but, but certainly America is cognizant of what's going on there. And as I said, I think the fact that for the average American things are actually getting worse yeah. makes it harder to accept what's happening for people at the top. But when you translate that into politics, you don't really see that in fact, you see it going almost the other way, as you right. say. The whole libertarian movement, there was an amazing piece in the Wall Street Journal op-ed page a day or two ago by a disciple of Hayek, you know, basically saying the government should be completely out of the redistribution right. business, and all it's doing is messing up the economy. It shouldn't be regulating anything. It shouldn't be having progressive tech. It was, it was amazing. Um, and so you don't see that happening. Uh, I would say that there are little glimmers. You know, the top tax rate was raised a year or so ago as yeah. part of one of the budget deals. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, as I said, is a major redistribution program, which includes a 2.8% tax on those of us at the top of our, on our investment income, which I'm happy to pay. So there are little bits and pieces, but um, I don't see the popular or political consensus behind it. Yeah. I mean, another question that gets raised, and, I, and David Brooks raised it, I think, in a recent column, is uh, the question is, is the, is the problem income inequality or is the problem the declining middle class? And do the two necessarily have something to do with each other? I think, I, I hope I tried to address that a little bit in the following couple contexts. One, I think that society would tolerate reasonable levels, maybe even high levels of income inequality if they felt that they themselves were doing better. Yeah. If their real incomes were going up, they, and the fact that some other guys was going up more, I think they can, I think they can deal with that. Um, I think that what you see happening in the very, you know, I tried to also show you that top 0.1%, those 16,000 households, uh, you know, I'm nothing against investment people or hedge fund people even, and they're not all hedge fund people, but the fact is there is a, there is a slice at the very, very top that is really quite extraordinary in terms of um, what's happening to their incomes and things like that. And I think that um, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not here to promote socialism. I don't think that, you know, we should just confiscate yeah. stuff from them, but I think we do have to put in place a set of policies that try to bring it closer together. Yeah, uh, those of you who were here earlier probably saw Larry Lessig talk quite powerfully 
um, on, the, on the power of money in politics. And interestingly, it wasn't something that, that you raised, um, but some people who write about in income inequality say one of the key reasons for income inequality is as the rich get richer and they put in laws that uh, exacerbate the inequality and that uh, the power of money in politics and the fact that we've allowed money to play such a role uh, is just gonna make it worse. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, th there's no question that the government uh, certainly, the, certainly the tax policies of the government, uh, really going back to Reagan, and until a few years ago, by and large, and there were a few, a few, other, you know, a few things that happened differently, but by and large, as I said, the top 400 Americans saw their tax rate go down by 10 percentage points over 20 years. And so there's no question that the, uh, you know, when we, had a, we had a 15 percent capital gains rate yeah. until recently. That's extraordinary. Yeah. What, what is the possible justification? Right. For 15% capital gains and rate. And I hate to get personal, but carried interest is also at a much lower rate than many people uh, think it should be. Uh, uh, a carried, look, carried interest is a ridiculous tax benefit, and I say that as a beneficiary of carried interest. I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I take it, but I'm, uh, but I'm embarrassed about it. It's, it's, um, <laughs> it's, uh, and I try to give it all away. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it's, you can't defend the indefensible, and, and that is, but look, in fairness, that's an emotional touchstone. I think the revenue from it is something like $30 billion over 10 years. I don't remember the number, but it's not a lot of money. Yeah. It's a symbolic thing. <laughs> in the scheme of a government that spends trillions of dollars every year. All right, okay. Um, one of the examples you keep hearing is Scandinavia. And by the way, I'm, I'm sure you may want to come back to some of these other issues, and you'll have plenty of time. Uh, how relevant is Scandinavia? Uh, to this discussion, because it always comes up and everybody always says socialist uh, governments in Scandinavia redistributing wealth and you have uh, much more equitable societies. It, it, is it really relevant to a much more diverse, pluralistic society that we have in the U.S.? Well, let me speak about it as an investor, because that's probably my most intimate mm -hmm. knowledge. Yeah. And I think you have to differentiate between a country like France, I hope there aren't too many French people here, and, and some of the Scandinavian countries. Because we invest in Scandinavia, we, we've been very successful investing in Scandinavia. It is a very entrepreneurial society. It encourages private enterprise. It just has a big social safety net right. and high taxes. France has a whole different program. Uh, you know, they, they believe the government should be intimately involved in the private sector, including owning companies, being on the boards of companies, uh, mandates, you know, the famous 35-hour work week, mandates about companies not being able to fire workers even if their business right. shrinks and, and things like that. And so you know, France would not be anywhere near my list. Of, so I think there's a way to do it that is conducive to economic growth, but also provides for the people who are not as well off. Yeah. Um, C, you know, I don't think you had a slide on CEO income. Uh, Joe Stiglitz just did a column, and uh, he's probably right. I have seen the statistic other places that the average CEO now makes 295 times uh, what the average worker does uh, in the U.S. Uh, th does CEO income have anything to do with this, or is, is it just symbolic, or does it suggest a way of looking at the world from, in the corporate world that lends itself to just increased income inequality? It's, it, uh, it's mostly symbolic because, as I said, there are 16,000 people in the top 0.01%. There's 1.4 million people in the top 1%. That's, you know, there's 500 companies in the Fortune 500. There are obviously other companies and people further down in the, in the and the top companies who make high incomes. Uh, there's no doubt that CEO compensation in this country is out of control in public companies. Um, and we could go through why that's happening, corporate governance problems, all that stuff, but it is. And, uh, and I think it's an important symbolic problem because I think it, again, sends this message to the average American that it's okay for CEO, including in some companies, as you all know, that are not doing so well, yeah. to take 10 or 15 or $20 million a year while the company uh, you know, yeah. may be laying off people or Whatever, and so um, I do think we need some corporate governance reform that would uh, that would deal with CO pay. But again, remember there are. Uh, I mean, I'm, I would be highly confident in saying that the vast majority of the people in the 0.01 percent are not CEOs of public companies. Yeah. They're people with private businesses, right. uh, people investment managers, people like that. Yeah, I'm just going to ask one more question because I really want to allow time for broader conversation, looking at the potential remedies and recognizing the difficulty of our political system to focus on multiple things at once, what would be the one or two top priorities you'd have to address this issue? Well, certainly, certainly the most economically efficient uh, way to address it would be through tax policy. Uh, thing, and, and I think, for example, you know, the, raising the minimum wage is all well and good. We should definitely raise the minimum wage. We can debate how far, but that's people at the really, you know, at the really bottom. Uh, the earned in, the, most people believe the earned income tax credit is a more efficient way 
to help people near the bottom. But then you have to get up and you have to help people, uh, help people in the middle class. So tax policy is the easiest, simplest. You could do it in an afternoon uh, if people were of, of mm -hmm. willing mind. Uh, you know, other social programs like uh, education, skills training, things like that are more complicated. You have to work through them. They take more time. And, but look, right now, the, the reality of the fact is right now, there's nothing happening in Washington. Absolutely nothing happening yeah. in Washington. You can barely get a post office named in Washington right now. And so the idea of going in there, you know, the idea, and the president, and I'm not here to make partisan comments, but the president has sent budget after budget up to the Hill with all these kinds of provisions in them to yeah. try to address these very issues. Yeah. And, you know, nada. So if we solve this problem, would you call it a rescue or a bailout? Anyway. <laughs> I always like rescue. That, that was a, 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 car, a car joke. That was a car joke. Anyway, let's open it up to the floor for a conversation. And, um, okay, we've got one in the back here. Making it hard on the microphone, people, okay. Sure, so uh, two questions. The first is, you know, uh, we have an overrepresentation of baby boomers in this room. Um, we are on the cusp of an unbelievable wealth transfer. Are there any um, opportunities that we have to address some of the challenges that you've outlined uh, as a part of the wealth transfer that's coming? And then the second question is, you identified um, sort of a number of key drivers uh, for the challenges that we have. Um, I wonder, has there been any uh, sort of books written that sort of look at the different policies or the different um, educational strategies across different countries that have done better than us so that we can sort of look, read through it and say, ah, if we addressed you know, these on policies, these on tax policies, these in education, et cetera? So on the first question, uh, on wealth transfers, yes, there's going to be a big wealth transfer. And I think one, and one of the battlegrounds that have occurred in the political process has been over the estate tax, or what some like to call the death tax. We actually had a year in which there was no estate tax, and quite a number of wealthy people died and paid, paid zero. That was uh, Congress at its best, and not, you know, like, <laughs> even passing anything. And today, the estate tax, I think, is at 40%. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, which is below where it's been. I think it's been as high as 50 or 55% with a higher, and there's also higher exemptions now. And so I think there's more we could do on the estate tax to allow a transfer of wealth. We want the baby boomers to benefit, but we also could use that money to fund some of the other stuff. In terms of the books you uh, suggest, I'm now going to just show you the limits of my expertise and, and uh, suggest that you go to Larry Summers' thing in the afternoon and ask him, because he will actually probably know. Okay, let's take one on this side, right over here. Um, as a uh, kid of a USAID uh, uh, career uh, person who grew up in developing countries, I would observe that uh, technology and globalization has been fantastic for the middle class and the poor, just not our middle class and the poor. Um, what strategies should we pursue in order to raise the competitiveness of our middle class and poor in the new global and uh, technologically driven economy? Well, let me say one thing about technology, which is slightly off the topic, but it's something I've also thought a lot about. I just wrote something about it, uh, something uh, I know, I think Larry Summers and I have argued about. Look, the technology, what's happened in technology is the, one of the great important uh, uh, signs of progress or, or me uh, ways that we have progressed as a country in the last 20 or 30 years. Produ you, you can't, I mean, just to be overly simplistic perhaps, you can't have economic growth without growth and productivity, without people becoming more efficient. They can't become more efficient without technology. You can call it automation, you can call it robots, you can call it the assembly line, you can call it whatever you want to call it. But we need that stuff in order to be a more productive country. It then has consequences because it displaces people who, the, who used to do something and now can't do that anymore. And that's where Skills training, retraining, you know, there's a whole, there's a, there's a, you know, we could spend the rest of the day going through the proposals that are out there. Some of them are good, some of them are less good for how you set up, uh, uh, how you set up retraining centers, how you set up uh, innovation centers, how you encourage industry to go to places. Now, let me just say one word about all that because I don't want everybody to, like, um, you know, I'm a business guy, and one of the principles that was laid down for us when we did the auto rescue was that we were not going to go run these companies, we were not going to pick winners, we didn't really want to have an industrial, we did not want to have an industrial policy. I really don't think the government getting in the business of picking companies or awarding special grants and things like that is a great place for the government to be. So you've got to find a balance. You have to do it with incentives rather than by picking winners and things like that. 
But I do believe the government has a big role in helping us adjust our economy. And look, remember one other thing. Uh, you know, I don't want everybody to leave here really depressed. It's a beautiful day. There's a lot more things to do, <laughs> a lot more things to do here. You know, we still have a lot going for us, right? We are the world leaders in technology. We are the world leaders in education. We are the world leaders in health. We are the world leaders in financial services. Maybe not everybody loves that, but we are. And we have this energy boom going on. And all those things not only produce jobs for us, not only potentially produce highly skilled and reasonably well-paid jobs, but many of them are export industries, and even ones you don't think about. If some, uh, if some uh, Indian family sends their child to the US to be educated, that's an export earning for the US. We're, we're getting rupees, and, and uh, you know, they're converting the rupees to dollars and giving them to us, and that's, that's all good. So we have a lot of these things going for us. Um, the biggest place where we have an issue, in my mind, is in manufacturing, where I think the situation is pretty tough and where we do have this kind of global competition that I think is going to be very hard for us to surmount, which is why I think we need to be focusing uh, more attention on the, the potential growth industries, potentially how government can help them, rather than, uh, rather than this manufacturing renaissance that I think is pretty illusory. Okay, right up here in the first row. Thanks very much. Um, I'm from Canada, and the political party that I, I support, which would be, I guess, more akin to the Democrats, um, one of the things, um, in spite of the graphs that, that we're seeing, is there, are, there is, in fact, a, a widening gap in Canada, despite the fact that our middle class is doing better. And one of the things that we've passed as a political party, and I'd be keen to know your, your thoughts on whether or not it would ever fly eventually in the United States would be this idea of a basic living wage where you provide a family with twenty to twenty five thousand um, dollars so that they're able to actually make or thirty thousand depending on what the cost is so that they're actually able to make a contribution to the economy and not have to worry about working five six jobs or whatever the, the case may be and that helps bump them in and hopefully over time to the middle class so two things um I did say, and just in my own defense, I did say that income inequality has gotten worse throughout the English-speaking world. I, I didn't use Canada as an example, but I'm aware of that. But as I also said, and I think you agree, it's, it is a much less contentious issue because the whole country is doing better and because the middle class is doing better, but it doesn't mean it's not a problem. Look, I think the problem with a basic, uh, look, I'm all for doing a lot of stuff to help people, believe me, I'm there. But you do have to get to the point of incentives at some stage. And while I'm nowhere near where that article in the Wall Street Journal that I referred to were, which is like get rid of all the stuff because so, nobody's going to go to work if you have unemployment insurance and all that, uh, you, do have to, you do have to find a boundary. And if you simply gave people twenty-five dollars or $30,000 a year and said you don't have to do anything, here, here's money, um, I'm not sure that would be great for incentives. I'm not sure that would be great for employment. And therefore, I'm not sure at the end of the day uh, it would be great for the economy. I think there are probably better ways that we can try to get those families uh, to the same place. Okay, other questions? Uh, right here in the middle. Hi, my question is, um, I remember back during the 1992 election with the discussion about NAFTA, um, and I believe it was Ross probably that discussed that giant sucking sound or whatever he mentioned about jobs leaving the United States. I was wondering, and I wasn't a supporter of him at the time, um, I was wondering, has he turned out to be correct um, in his, what he said? Has there been unforeseen consequences, or did we know this going into it, that it would devastate our manufacturing base? Well, I think, I, I think that giant sucking sound that he predicted was actually the sucking sound of China sucking jobs from Mexico and the U.S., not the sucking sound of Mexico sucking jobs from the U.S. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't involved in the NAFTA debate, but it, it, the debate centered around exactly what you said, that Mexico would be taking jobs from the U.S., and they have, and I'll come back to that in a second. But the bigger threat to both Mexico and the U.S. in manufacturing, what we call the tradable sector, are places like China, not just China. You know, every, you know, some of you will say to me, oh, well, wages in China are going up. Yeah, they're going up. They're still a lot lower than they are here. But then you get to you know, Vietnam and Indonesia and the Philippines and all these other places around the world where wages in India where wages are still much, much lower, and productivity is rising. You know, they are assembling um, citation jets in China now. Uh, that is a complex manufacturing process that we, for a time, did not, did not think could really happen outside the US or Europe. They are assembling Lear jets in Mexico right now. And if you talk to General Motors, they will tell you their productivity in uh, Mexico is just as high as it is here, maybe higher. And if you also look, so a little dirty little secret, you know, I know this is off the record, no, no cameras or anything. Um, a dirty little secret, you know, 
General Motors significantly downsized, I think, about 30,000 jobs over the last uh, four or five years post-rescue. Their employment in Mexico actually kept creeping up by a few hundred jobs a year because it was a more efficient, lower cost way to produce. So this is really tough for us. Now, on the other hand, NAFTA has, not just NAFTA, but all the free trade agreements have, bought, have brought enormous benefits to us. If you look at what's happened to the price of stuff that is not manufactured here anymore, like furniture, like apparel, things like that, those prices have actually been coming down and down and down. I went on Amazon the other day to buy a pair of workout shorts, and they were like $6 or something like that. Uh, you know, I, I, know th I know they weren't made here, but, but the point is that I do believe these free trade agreements, including NAFTA, have brought enormous benefits to the country as a whole, but there have been winners and losers. And our job, the government's job, is to help the losers and, and ask the winners to put some of their winnings into the pot to help those losers. OK, um, over here in the middle. Sorry, I'm making you run around a lot. One of the most uh, striking statistics you showed was how the US and UK departed from the rest of the developed world around uh, 1980. Uh, so a natural question is what's different? Uh, because globalization, these other trends, technology, also affected Germany, France, uh, Denmark. Uh, so uh, in looking at what's different about the US and UK, you mentioned uh, taxes. But another factor has been corporate governance. And you touched on that very briefly. Uh, there have been studies looking at who is inside that top 0.1%, uh, and it is primarily people getting uh, income from capital, stock options, uh, senior executives, uh, financial services people, and so on. So isn't, isn't corporate governance and the way we compensate people uh, a key part of this? Um, sure. So let's just go back, though, to the beginning of what you said, because uh, I think the if you, looked at, if you remember the chart I showed on taxes, the difference in what we've done to our tax rates here and what the UK did versus what France and Sweden and all those other countries have done is mammoth. And remember, it compounds. If I pay 20% less tax one year than I otherwise would have, I have 20% more money. I invest that. The next year, I have income on that 20%. I have another 20% I've just gotten. I invest that. And pretty soon, you get huge amounts of wealth compounding and income off that wealth, which just exacerbates the whole problem. So if you ask me what is the biggest problem, I would say it is tax policy. The problem of incomes is more complicated because you have the public companies we talked about where I think there's a corporate governance problem. You have, but then you have the question of, uh, let's leave the hedge fund guys out of it for a minute, but then you have the question of some guy who starts a company and he, you know, and he makes, you know, he makes uh, I don't know what he makes, he makes water bottles. And he's built this business by himself. Actually, we have someone right here in Aspen, right? The, the Resnicks of Fiji Water. They started Fiji Water. It's a huge success. They've made a huge amount of money off of it. You know, what part of government was supposed to tell them they shouldn't do that and they shouldn't become as wealthy as they can? And so I think the fact that we do reward that sex, success is a good thing. There are definitely societal norms in some of these other countries that, that just, it's just unseemly. Where, uh, and I'm trying to think of the company where, where uh, Oh, it was in Switzerland, Switzerland uh, a drug, yeah, Switzerland. Um, was it Novartis? I think it was Novartis. Uh, the CEO retired. He was retired to a huge uh, retirement package, golden parachute, whatever you want to call it. There was a huge outcry. He ended up giving most or all of it back. You know, I'm not sure you'd see that happen in America. Um, <laughs> and so we have some of those societal norms. But again, you have to be careful. You want people, look, honestly, you, you know, I, I hope I've established my credentials and my my passion for the subject, but you want people to feel that they can get rich. I mean, that is part of economic growth. That's part of a country becoming prosperous. That's part of what built this country, was the fact that people came here thinking they be could become wealthy. So you've got to find a balance in here. We've gone way too far one way. France has gone too far the other way. OK, I'm afraid we have time for one more question, uh, all the way in the back by the camera. Up oh, there you are. Uh, can you comment, please, on the role of unions? Can they help? Do they hurt? And. Uh just in general, unions in America? So that's a great question, and I, I touched on it you know, in literally a second. Let me talk about unions. So um, first of all, I was a member of a union for nine and a half years when I was a journalist, the Newspaper Guild. Um, look, I think unions can and should play an important part in helping workers. It's part of the uh, negotiating process. It's their leverage. It's terms of trade. I think, I think unions have a complete right to exist. You know, we can get into things like the Supreme Court decision yesterday, which I'm not qualified to talk about. But look, unions, unions should exist. There's two problems with unions. One, when we got to General Motors, 
they had 300 job classifications. If you were in charge of water bottles, you couldn't touch microphones. If you were in touch of microphones, you couldn't uh, fold up the seats after a presentation. And so there was an enormous loss of productivity, enormous amount of inefficiency, and that is bad. I don't think there's any justifiable defense for that in uh, an economy. The second challenge of unions is harder, and one that I don't have a great answer to, but we have to understand it, which is you can, unions can uh, be effective in what we call the non-tradable sectors. If the unions want to strike McDonald's, if the unions want to uh, unionize McDonald's, strike McDonald's, get paid more at McDonald's, that's fine with me. I mean, that, that'll you know, raise McDonald's hamburgers prices a little bit. I don't go there very often, so it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> but seriously, but it, you know, that's OK. But, but what we saw in the car industry and what you would see in any so-called, again, tradable sector where we're competing on a global stage, not just in the US, is that our wages have to be competitive, adjusted for productivity, adjusted for transportation costs, adjusted for a lot of things. They have to be competitive with the rest of the world, or we can't compete. So it is of no real benefit for the, worker, for the auto workers to come in and say, we want to be paid $28 an hour again, because then the car comes to be right back where we started in 2009, more or less, and that wouldn't be great for the country. So that, that's a real problem, uh, and you, not a problem that unions can solve. So yes, I'm fine with unions uh, playing a constructive role where, the, where we can remain competitive. Uh, so let me close by asking you very quickly the 2024 question. Is income inequality going to be greater or less in the U.S. in 2024? I, I think that without, I know you don't, they don't like ifs, but, but I think on our present course and speed, sure, because it's getting higher and higher. You know, if you look at the last couple of years, the rich took a little bit of a hit in 2009. Uh, we're paying a bit higher taxes now, so that'll kind of hold it down a bit. But the trajectory, you know, the line is moving. So the only way it doesn't move is if we have a sea change in Washington and a dramatic change, uh, a dramatic change in policies. Okay, so on that optimistic note, uh, we'll close. Uh, very, thanks to Steve Ratner for a very provocative conversation. <laughs>